catastrophizing. Remember that time you had a little cough and you think you have lung cancer and two months left to live? This mental habit is called catastrophizing, and it takes normal worries and inflates them into worst-case scenarios. It's not just you. Our ancestors survived by assuming danger first and asking questions later. If you thought every rustle in the grass was a snake, you lived longer than the optimist who blamed the wind. Evolution built our minds to overestimate threats because fear kept us alive. In modern life, though, this instinct mostly backfires. We imagine disasters that never happen, draining energy and fueling anxiety. A little caution keeps you safe. But when every minor problem feels apocalyptic, that's no longer a survival instinct. That's your brain auditioning for a drama it wrote itself. But even when the danger isn't real, your brain still craves stories about people who are. Gossiping. Humans love to talk, and especially to talk about each other, whether it's celebrity scandals or that one coworker who mysteriously works from home every Friday, gossip is our species' favorite background noise. But it's not just pettiness, it's biology. Our primate cousins bonded by picking fleas out of each other's fur. Early humans had too many friends for that, so we used words instead. Gossip was social glue. It told us who to trust, who to avoid, and who stole the last bite of meat last week. According to anthropologist Robin Dunbar, gossip basically replaced grooming as our version of keeping the tribe together. That ancient bonding tool got stuck in modern overdrive. Today we gossip about movie stars, influencers, and people we'll never meet. It's social grooming without the survival part. Just endless chatter about who unfollowed who. Now, we just replace who cheated the tribe with who cheated on Love Island. And when those stories start shaping who we trust and who we don't, that's where tribal instincts kick in. In-group bias. Your brain still thinks it's living in a tribe of 50 people. That's why you instinctively trust people who look, talk, or think like you, and side-eye everyone else. It's called in-group bias, and it's one of evolution's oldest social hacks. Back in the savanna days, it made perfect sense. Sticking with your own clan meant food, protection, and someone to watch your back during lion season. Helping insiders and being wary of outsiders kept small groups alive. Cooperation within the group was Survival 101, but that ancient code now runs in a world of billions. Instead of uniting tribes, it divides nations, workplaces, and comment sections. Online, it builds echo chambers, where everyone agrees and no one listens. In real life, it fuels favoritism, nepotism, and the us-versus-them mode of thinking. Each of these tribal habits once helped us belong, but now they just build new walls. Of course, once we have an us, we need a them. And once we feel safe inside our tribe, our brains start chasing the next thing that kept early humans alive, reward. Dopamine addiction. Once upon a time, dopamine was your brain's survival GPS. It told you what was worth chasing, food, safety, connection, and gave you a little chemical high every time you got closer. In the wild, that system worked beautifully. A spark of motivation meant the difference between starving and finding dinner. But in the modern world, that same system is lost in the supermarket. Dopamine still screams, chase this, but now it's pointing at notifications, likes, and 30-second TikTok videos instead of berries or shelter. It's a compass built for scarcity, dropped into a world of infinite stimulation, and it keeps spinning in circles. Evolution never prepared us for abundance. Our ancestors' reward loops had natural limits. You couldn't hunt 24-7, and there was no such thing as mammoth memes back in the day. But today, every app, ad, and algorithm hijacks that ancient wiring turning survival motivation into compulsive distraction. The chase never ends because the reward is endless and empty. What used to keep us alive now keeps us hooked. Dopamine used to guide us toward meaning. Now it traps us in loops of meaningless wanting. It's not evolution's fault. It just hasn't caught up yet. But when that endless chase leaves us restless and unsatisfied, our brains look for someone to blame. Scapegoating. When things go wrong, humans love to point fingers ideally at someone else. In early human groups, this had a purpose. When food was scarce or tempers flared, blaming one outsider could calm the rest of the group down. It's like emotional crowd control, uniting the group by turning anger in a single direction. Anthropologists think scapegoating worked as a pressure valve. It didn't solve the problem, but it stopped the tribe from tearing itself apart. Today, that instinct often backfires. We still reach for simple explanations by finding a person to blame, even when the real issues are complex. History is full of examples, entire communities blaming outsiders, or workplaces blaming one unlucky teammate. It feels satisfying in the moment, but it poisons trust and delays real solutions. Scapegoating once held the tribe together, now it just holds us back. 
But sometimes we don't just follow the crowd. We obey whoever's in charge. Obedience to authority. Humans are born with a built-in autopilot for following the leader. From childhood, we learn to listen to anyone who seems to be in charge. It's called obedience to authority, and it's hardwired deeper than we think. Early human bands needed coordination. Someone had to call the shots during a hunt or decide when to move camp. Respecting authority kept order and prevented chaos. Following the tribe's best hunter or wisest elder was how the group survived. But that same instinct can short circuit in the modern world. In the 1960s, psychologist Stanley Milgram tested this by asking volunteers to give electric shocks to another person whenever they answered a question wrong. The shocks were fake, but the volunteers didn't know that, and most kept going even when the victim screamed in pain just because a man in a lab coat told them to. That's how powerful obedience can be. Today, we still see it. Employees afraid to speak up, cults worshiping false prophets, or influencers convincing millions to buy their meme coins. We still confuse confidence for competence, and that's how bad ideas get followers. Obedience once kept us alive. Now, without critical thinking, it can make us dangerously easy to steer. Our obedience may be wired in, but so is the need to look good while doing it. Reputation management. There's a tiny PR manager living in your brain. It's the voice that tells you to not post your picture unless you've added five filters. That little manager evolved to help you survive, not to boost your follower count. In small tribes, your reputation was your lifeline. Everyone knew everyone. So one bad move, hoarding food, skipping chores, lying, could get you labeled unreliable and suddenly nobody shared with you. Keeping a good image meant you got fed, protected, and included in the group. We evolved to constantly monitor how others see us. That's why embarrassment hurts, like being punched in the soul. But today, that ancient instinct runs 24-7 in the age of selfies and social media. Now we're editing, filtering, and crisis managing our lives like unpaid publicists. Instead of protecting us from exile, it just fuels anxiety and comparison. And when managing our image isn't enough, we start comparing it to everyone else's. Social comparison. Humans can't help it. We're walking, talking, measuring sticks. From the moment we joined groups, we've sized ourselves up against everyone else. Who's stronger? Who's smarter? Who gets the better share of meat from the day's hunt? That ancient instinct helped our ancestors know their place and how to climb the ladder. Back then, comparison was useful. If your neighbor made sharper tools, you learned from them. If someone outran you, you trained harder. It was feedback for survival. But now, we've turned it into a full-time hobby. Scrolling through filtered lives and wondering why ours doesn't look like a travel commercial. Constant upward comparison, seeing others as better off, tanks self-esteem, and spikes anxiety. A little comparison can inspire growth. Too much just turns life into a leaderboard, nobody wins. And sometimes, when we can't compete in the present, we romanticize the past. Nostalgia bias. Remember when everything felt simpler? Saturday morning cartoons, summer vacations that lasted forever, and zero back pain. That's nostalgia, your brain's favorite editing software. It clips out the boredom, filters the bad lighting, and uploads a highlight reel labeled the good old days. Originally, this bias helped us stay sane and connected. Remembering the past fondly kept early humans optimistic. If things were good once, maybe they'll be good again. Psychologists think it even helped with survival and reproduction. Mothers who didn't vividly remember the agony of childbirth were more likely to have more kids. Evolution, it seems, relies on selective memory. But today, nostalgia can trap us in a loop of, it was better back then. We compare messy reality to a photoshopped past. And reality always loses. Studies show, nostalgic reflection can boost happiness and creativity, but too much can make us resistant to change. Nostalgia once helped us endure hard times. Now it just convinces us that music from our generation was better than everything else. But nostalgia's rosy filter pairs nicely with another bug. The illusion we're smarter than we are. Overconfidence bias. Humans are walking confidence scams, mostly against ourselves. Ask a room of people if they're above average drivers, and nearly everyone raises a hand. Mathematically, half of them are wrong. That's overconfidence bias, the built-in tendency to believe we're smarter, faster, or luckier than we actually are. A little swagger helped our ancestors take shots they might have otherwise missed. Take a risky hunt, pitch a bold plan, try the unfamiliar path, but overconfidence doesn't check the map. It just floors the gas. Game theory models even show that a mildly delusional population can outcompete a realistic one. Believing you'll win makes you actually fight harder. That boost is useful until reality sends the bill. In today's world, 
That same bias fuels bad startups, reckless investments, sports betting, and disastrous wars. It's why we overcommit, underprepare, and blame bad luck when things blow up. That confidence often makes us double down, especially when walking away would be smarter. Sunk cost fallacy. You've spent two hours watching a terrible movie, but you can't turn it off now. You've already invested too much time in being miserable. That's the sunk cost fallacy in action. The brain's refusal to walk away from a bad deal. Originally, this instinct made some sense. Our ancestors lived in unpredictable worlds where persistence often paid off. If a hunter gave up too soon, he might miss prey or fresh water just over the ridge. So evolution built us with a don't quit bias, honoring effort, even when logic says bail. It reinforced loyalty, consistency, and group trust. Nature basically decided it's better to waste energy than look flaky. But in the modern world, this wiring turns on us. We stay in failing jobs, doomed relationships, or bad investments because I've come this far. Economists call that irrational. Therapists call it exhausting. While evolution rewarded persistence, capitalism rewards knowing when to cut your losses. And when logic fails, we let superstition pretend it's in charge. Superstition. Your brain is basically a pattern hunting machine on caffeine. It connects dots, even when the dots don't exist. Knock on wood, crossing your fingers, wearing a gold thong to hit a baseball. That is actually real. You should look it up. All of these are tiny echoes of an ancient survival instinct. Back in the wild, spotting patterns meant life or death. Hear a rustle in the grass? Better assume it's a predator than the wind. Evolution rewarded paranoia. A few false alarms were fine if one correct guess saved your life. That same hyperactive pattern detector helped early humans notice real cause and effect. Dark clouds mean a storm. Smoke means fire. But it also made us see fake patterns. Rituals, charms, and good luck dances were early attempts to control the uncontrollable. Fast forward to now, and we're still running that ancient software in a world full of randomness. Breaking a mirror won't curse you, but your brain feels better. Pretending it knows the rules, scientists call it illusory pattern perception. We just call it superstition. When chaos spikes, so do rituals. Not because they work, but because doing something feels safer than doing nothing. Our brains invent patterns to control chaos, but sometimes they just want control of space itself. Territorial instincts. Deep down, every human has a tiny guard dog living in their brain, and it freaks out any time someone parks too close. That's our ancient territorial instinct, the urge to mark, claim, and defend what's ours. Whether it's a cave, a cubicle, or the last open treadmill at the gym. Back in prehistory, this reflex made perfect sense. Territory meant survival. The patch of land you protected held food, water, and shelter. Losing it could mean death. So evolution rewarded people who stood their ground, even if the cost was high. The instinct worked beautifully when the stakes were mammoths, not mailboxes. Now, that same wiring starts wars over parking spots, office chairs, and imaginary lines on maps. We guard our spaces online, too. From fandom turf wars to comment section crusades, and even once we've claimed our ground, we keep chasing the next thing that'll make us happy. Happiness wears off. You finally get the dream job, the new phone, or that shiny car you've always wanted since you were a kid, and a few weeks later, it all just feels so normal. That's your brain resetting its happiness meter. Psychologists call it hedonic adaptation, the reason joy fades faster than your phone battery. Evolution built this feature on purpose. Our ancestors couldn't afford to stay blissed out after one good hunt. They had to move on, find more food, and watch for predators. If pleasure lasted forever, someone dancing with joy over yesterday's berries wouldn't notice today's tiger lurking behind them. Adaptation kept us alert, not content. But now, it backfires. We keep chasing the next upgrade, the next trip, the next, this will finally make me happy. Studies even show lottery winners return to their old happiness levels within a year. The thrill fades, the baseline resets, and we start hunting again, this time in the mall instead of the wild. Chasing the next dopamine hit makes living in the moment sound tempting, especially when it's designed by evolution. YOLO syndrome. We've all said, I'll start tomorrow, and say the exact same thing the next day. That's your ancient brain doing temporal discounting, valuing a quick hit of pleasure today over bigger payoffs later. It's why we pick dessert over diets, impulse buys over retirement funds, and one more episode over eight hours of sleep. For our ancestors, this made total sense. The future was a wild card. You could save food for later, and then a hyena might eat both you and the leftovers. Taking the reward now was the safer bet. That instinct worked great in an unpredictable world where later wasn't guaranteed. 
But today, that same wiring turns into a self-sabotage machine. We trade long-term gains for short-term comfort. Economists even have data. People regularly pick $50 now instead of $100 a year later. Evolution built us for surviving the moment, not for planning retirement funds. And finally, when survival meets self-promotion, it all ends on the modern stage of morality. Virtue signaling. If morality had a runway, virtue signaling would be the fashion show. It's the act of flaunting your values for an audience, posting the right hashtags, sharing the right outrage, or delivering heartfelt speeches, all from the comfort of the couch. In ancient tribes, showing moral loyalty actually mattered. Publicly condemning cheaters or praising generosity signaled you were trustworthy, someone worth cooperating with. Virtue signaling was social glue. Now, the same instinct has gone digital. We don't shout across the campfire. We post on social media. But the problem is that saying I care has become easier than showing it. Anyone can rack up moral points with a few keystrokes. It feels righteous, costs nothing, and sometimes helps no one. Still, it's not all bad. Public stances can spark awareness or inspire action. But let's be honest, sometimes it's less about saving the world and more about curating our feed. If you like this video and want to learn more about useless things evolution left behind, check out these other videos.